and this masterclass in the Critical Internationalization Studies Network series focuses on internationalization of higher education through a languages lens. Before I begin this presentation, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from where I present to you today. For me, I am sitting on Yagura and Turbo country in Mianjin, otherwise known as Brisbane in Queensland, on the east coast of Australia. I would like to pay my respects to elders past and present and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters and culture, as well as their contribution to Australian and global society. I acknowledge that Indigenous sovereignty has never been ceded and that we are coming virtually together on Indigenous land. Now, before proceeding with the formalities of this presentation, allow me to subvert, even if briefly, the order in which a typical master class might proceed. Allow me to ask you to pause and think, what brings you here to this video? What is it that you would personally like to learn about and reflect on with regards to the internationalization processes through a languages lens? What comes to your mind when you think of languages and internationalization? Perhaps you can only literally think of and in only one language, in the singular. Perhaps it is the very language in which you and I are communicating now, in which you and I are co-constructing this presentation. Perhaps this is not your mother tongue, it is not mine, but the fact that I am using it and that we are sharing it <coughs> illustrates part of the interlocking systems of oppression underlying internationalization processes that we will explore together. I know because I am a product of these processes. In this masterclass, I would like you to join me as we approach exploration of internationalization through the following three entry points. First, stretching our imaginaries of internationalization through a languages lens. Second, considering critically the role of language and languages in knowledge across three intersecting processes, the transmission, the production, and the dissemination of knowledge. And third and final, exploring the challenges and opportunities ahead as we strive for cognitive justice and onto epistemological pluriverses, as opposed to universal ways of being and knowing. So let's begin with the first entry point. Languages represent for me the lens through which I engage with the literature on internationalization. I believe it is a lens that remains under-researched and I hope to share and discuss with you some emerging literature across disciplines, not only in higher education studies but also across various branches of applied linguistics. I should also say that my passion for languages is what's driven my research in this area, but also my personal experiences as an international student from a non-English speaking country, my training as an EFL teacher and my current position as a Spanish and Latin American studies specialist. I think it is also important to acknowledge the potential circularity and difficulty of engaging with this languages lens through language itself and through English in particular. We must remind ourselves 
that the way in which we talk about languages is not neutral. The labels that we use to qualify languages as foreign, heritage, community are not neutral. The ways in which we refer to speakers as native, non-native, emerging bilinguals are also not neutral. They carry a lot of meaning that we often neglect to acknowledge. And to complicate matters, often when we talk about languages in higher education, there is an erasure of indigenous languages and also sign languages and other forms of communication. So when we consider internationalization through a languages lens, the dominance of the English language becomes apparent. This dominance has been described as being associated with the Anglophone asymmetry, whereby universities located in the Anglophone centre, the US, the UK and Australia in particular, attract more than 50% of the international student population worldwide. This also reinforces the fact that internationalisation is understood very differently depending on whether institutions belong to the Anglophone Centre or not. If they do, a key driver in their strategy is recruiting international students who typically do not have English as the mother tongue. Meanwhile, for institutions in non-Anglophone contexts, a key driver is ensuring that they can remain competitive by providing English medium instruction or developing high levels of English language proficiency in their students. In most cases, the US, the UK and Australia use their privileged English speaking status to attract international students who are enticed by the desire and aspiration to acquire English as social and professional capital. Interestingly, it is in these predominantly English-speaking countries that monolingualism is prevalent and where reportedly the study of languages other than English is in a permanent state of crisis. What starts to emerge underlining this asymmetry is a deficit narrative around languages and linguistic diversity particularly in the case of institutions belonging to the Anglophone Centre, where both international and so-called domestic students appear to be homogeneously conceptualised as separate groups, and in both cases there is a language problem that needs to be resolved. On the one hand, in the case of international students, it is their level of English language proficiency which is constantly policed, and their apparent deficiencies in the English language, which are a constant focus of attention. On the other hand, in the case of domestic students, there is the problem of the so-called foreign languages uptake, which within this dominant internationalization imaginary, ultimately renders these students less competitive against the ways in which we conceptualize intercultural and global graduates. In neither case, the actual linguistic diversity of these groups is considered as a potential resource for the enrichment of all. What university mission statements and internationalization strategy documents tell us is that they tend to look at linguistic diversity as something being imported, brought to us by the international student body. They diversify and multilingualize us and our campuses. But then for home or domestic students, engagement with diversity and the development of multilingualism can mainly be achieved through in some cases vulnerable world language programs or simply away from campus 
by going overseas on exchange. So going back to the description of multilingual campuses in which many institutions operate, we must consider whose multilingualism is being encouraged and celebrated and in relation to what languages. We must therefore engage with um, multiple and sometimes contradictory ways in which multilingualism and linguistic diversity become commodifiable objects of privilege and prestige, whilst opening a gulf of vulnerability and inequalities in access to eliteness and the particular socioeconomic conditions and points in time, as Barakas and Salek highlight. For the most part, as Lady Kurt has stated before, mainstream internationalization approaches can be conceived as an instance of a monolingual habitus that constructs internationalization as something that occurs mainly through a single language, being English, and which requires only knowledge of that language for full participation in the internationalized academy. And this takes us to our second entry point. Universities, higher education institutions, are all positioned as major interlocutors in the knowledge economy, contributing to the configuration, production, distribution, and application of knowledge. In mainstream internationalization literature, Knowledge appears to be conceived as a commodity to be traded for economic prosperity, where knowledge products and highly educated personnel contribute to economic growth. However, rather than promoting equal flows of knowledge, equally benefiting various stakeholders and society at large, the modern internationalized universities underpinned by a model of knowledge driven prosperity and growth, which tends to flow into already dominant key players, thus maintaining their linguistic and epistemic dominance. Indeed, in the case of predominantly Anglophone universities, the domination of Western epistemic perspectives both affirms and perpetuates a monolingual English and monocultural Eurocentric model of knowledge production and model of scientific engagement. The transmission of knowledge through English as the unquestioned medium of instruction affirms that it is the only acceptable vehicle for knowledge in the modern world. A practice which is reinforced through scholarly publications and which has resulted in the epistemological monolingual and monocultural encoding and dissemination of knowledge. As such, the monolingual hegemonic dominance of English in the dissemination of knowledge is further realized through the monocultural conceptualization of how the scientific expression of this knowledge should be presented, mainly through objective neutral, unbiased, unemotional, straightforward language that has no trace of positionality or situatedness. This takes us to a third and final entry point, which is concerned with cognitive justice. That is the recognition of epistemic diversity and the fight against epistemicide, that is the murder or extermination of knowledge and ways of knowing, and striving to recognize and advance rich ecologies of knowledge that value other ways of being and knowing in the world. How can we create a linguistically mediated epistemic pluriverse as a strategic response to un the violence of universalism. Ultimately, 
a reduction of linguistic diversity is directly related to a reduction in epistemic diversity and biodiversity, which can effectively lead to a kind of linguistically mediated epistemicide. Indigenous knowledges, for example, encoded in language and other forms of communication are concerned with protection of all ways of life, not just human beings, but also the non-human, animals, plants, rivers and the land. Linguistic diversity is just as important as other types of biodiversity within this ecosystem. So what might a polyphonic university look like? Perhaps a place where linguistic diversity is considered as part of the biodiversity of the world. Language in this context should be re-envisioned as a medium for engaging critically in interpretive meaning-making processes that can illuminate and enhance communication across difference. This would necessarily entail a shift in the organizational philosophy of the higher education sector and the structural realignment between university mission statements, curriculum goals, everyday teaching practices that value linguistic diversity as a resource. We need to reflect on how a languages lens might be impacting the ways in which we interrogate our teaching and research practices in order to dismantle our own understandings as well as our social, ethical and ontopistemological conceptions of language. We cannot underestimate the resilience of monoglossic ideologies underpinning our own engagement as well as our students' engagement with the languages classrooms as we know it. We have to push against the resilient boundaries of current imaginaries, the systemic internalized ways of thinking about languages which ultimately perpetuate separation and exclusion in order to think from the perspectives, um, from the unthought yet to be imagined pedagogies that can reinforce a strength-based narrative around linguistics diversity. I would like to leave you with some questions to consider moving forward and attending to these ideas. Who benefits from commodified versions of multilingualism in the modern internationalized university? How might institution-wide language policies help promote equitable approaches to multilingualism? Whose linguistic repertoires are included or excluded in these policies? How might staff and students be encouraged to draw on their linguistic repertoires to challenge dominant epistemologies, traditional models of knowledge transmission, production and dissemination produced and reproduced by universities around the world? In this presentation, I have raised some questions and considered some entry points in this conversation. Many of these questions and ideas require individual reflection and collaborative attention to find solutions that may affect transformative change. I envisage this collaboration taking place as a critically collective professional body within languages and intercultural studies, but more importantly, through generative transdisciplinary conversations with fields such as critical internationalization studies, philosophy and linguistic anthropology. This may enable to harness complementary linkages amongst these fields and in so doing develop more nuanced context sensitive theorizations, analytical and methodological frameworks through which to teach and conduct research through a languages lens. We cannot do this work alone. Thank you so much for following along. Please have a look at the accompanying list of references that 
we used to create this masterclass. And please do not hesitate to contact me to keep in touch and keep this conversation going.